We know energy is the foundation of our very modern lives, but scientists are telling us there's also a cost and an impact in how we get our fuel. So how do we bridge from oil and gas to the energies of the future? It's a topic explored in the documentary called Switch by Dr. Scott Tinker from the University of Texas. Let's talk about this film. What's your main point? The star is energy. And the point of the film was to expose people, people curious, to global energy, all different kinds, because there's a lot of misinformation out there today about all of it. Energy is so critical to all of our lives. Without energy, you and I are sitting here hungry and naked in the dirt, literally. There's nothing sure. in it we've eaten without energy. So it's so involved in our lives that it engages everybody. You visited personally a lot of big energy sites to see how they work, to see how they don't work. What we tried to do for all energies is go to the best sites in the world. I needed to see how energy is made from coal to solar and everything in between. I went to the Bel Air mine, which makes enough energy to power 3.6 million people per year the largest coal reserve in the world. About half of our electricity comes from coal, correct? And half of that is coming from right here. Take a massive global fuel supply, combine it with fast, simple power generation, and you get the cheapest electricity in the world. Uh, on the other hand, coal has these external problems yeah. with it local air pollution, sulfur in particular, uh, and then the global problem of carbon dioxide. Coal may be the foundation of our electricity system, but oil is what allows us to move. We went to the deepest water offshore platform in the world at the time, Perdido, in the Gulf mm -hmm. of Mexico, 8,000 feet of water. Unbelievable scale, because it's such a major operation. It's hard to describe to viewers the level of technology. The Perdido platform is more than two hours from shore by helicopter and could power 1.7 million people per year. We're producing, and we have the rig on board so we can work on the wells as well. Oil makes up the largest portion of our energy use, so oil alternatives were the place to start. We came back on shore and we looked at uh, natural gas. We went right to a, a hydraulic fracturing or fracking site and looked at natural gas fracking in the Barnett. A field that can power 18 million people per year. Hydraulic fracturing is a way of first drilling a well and then pumping down fluids, uh, water, other chemicals, uh, and inducing the rock to break. But there's a controversy surrounding fracturing that centers on water. There are 15,000 gallons of additives going into each of these wells. And what people are worried about is, will fracturing contaminate our water supply? And then we went over and looked at LNG and Qatar and that's the largest liquefied natural yes. gas exporting facility in the world. Qatar in the last 10 years has you know, grown from zero production to about 30% of the world market. Low carbon, low price, mean that natural gas will likely be a vital part of our energy transition. I just want to give everybody an idea of, of the variety of things that you have looked at. Mm -hmm. And what's referred to as natural energy. So let's talk about wind, let's talk about solar. We went to the best sites for all of them. You have to have a lot of infrastructure to capture that energy and make it dense enough so that we can consume it. Could solar be the answer? The average solar array powers just 0.4 people per year, which means it'll take several years for the savings to offset the cost of the panels. Half of U.S. wind is probably within 500 miles of here. We've got almost 100,000 acres in the Roscoe Wind Farm. 100,000 acres. And this amazing wind resource that we've got through here. To make wind work on a grand scale, we'll first need to figure out transmission, and then how to manage that much intermittent power. The challenge with the low-density fuels is they're also intermittent. And you know, you say, hey, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. That's not trivial. We use electrons in real time. Not, not when you have a population waiting for that power every day. They don't want to flip on a light switch, not get a light because the sun wasn't shining. I mean, we literally use the electron as it's generated. It moves at the speed of light. 
So we, if we can store energy better, that helps to solve a lot of things. And as a matter of fact, you have all the big thinkers in, in industry, from Bill Gates to everyone else, challenging yes. everyone to come up with battery technology because that will be the game changer in how to store the energy that we're making right now and using real time. And Bill Gates is doing a wonderful thing, pulling together big investors. And batteries, as we think of them, are chemical batteries. And that's one part. But there are other forms. Pumped hydro, pumping water up a hill when you have extra wind or sun, storing it and flowing it down the hill through a little turbine. Yeah. So just a lot of creative things going on. Now, when I say solve it, what does it mean? Scalable, affordable, and reliable. It can't be only two. It has to be at scale. It has to be reasonably priced. And it has to be reliable. That's a tough challenge in energy storage. It's why guys like Bill Gates, who I'd love to meet, you know, are talking about this and saying, hmm, not so much. And if you listen carefully what Bill Gates is saying, when he said, why don't you just push solar and wind? And he carefully says, because there are challenges there too. Since you've looked at all of this, and it seems like you've taken some great time to measure it, and technology is ever advancing, and things might be different a month after we do this interview, but what seems to be the source of energy that makes the most sense based on what you've seen? Mm -hmm. There isn't one. And I think we all get in trouble by picking winners. So the sources of energy and all energy, they are resources. The sun isn't great everywhere. The wind isn't great everywhere. We've got to use what we have and that mix is really important. Just like a stock portfolio or a real estate portfolio, having multiple options is good because these things can come and go. We take it for granted, we flip a switch, uh, light comes on, but actually uh, somebody is uh, in very short time intervals, uh, so-called dispatching different plants, right. gas plants, nuclear plants, coal plants, yeah. wind plants, uh, to match the instantaneous demand. When people watch Switch, what do you want them, what's the intent? What do you want them to walk away with when they close the computer or turn off it and just say, I got what? I got an objective look at energy and understand it's critical to my life. And I'm gonna go out there more educated into the radical middle and help work on real solutions. And in your estimation, is that what it takes to get a solution? We all have to, everybody has to come from the sides and kind of find their place in the middle and choose from a menu. Absolutely, and that mix will vary. It will vary, and there's gonna be some of the things you may not like, but I wanna communicate this really clearly. There are 1.4 billion people in the world today with no electricity. That's five United States with no electricity. Energy lifts them from poverty. It has lifted the world from poverty, any energy. So when you're thinking about lifting the world from poverty, which allows them to get a roof, some food, education, you have to recognize that although the environmental components of what we're talking about are critical, lifting the world out of poverty is also pretty important. And energy does that, all energy. You're getting the picture here that nothing's perfect. No energy source is without some challenges. The important thing is to change the way we think about energy so we can change the way we use it. Just by doing a whole lot of simple things, um, mostly paying attention, turning things off when we right. didn't really use them, I was able to reduce the electricity use at our house by almost 40%. These are steps that save money, they save energy, they save emissions, they're good for the climate, they're good for security, they're good for your pocketbook. Mm -hmm. That's the place to start. As I've traveled the world, I've come to realize that in fact, there's a tremendous role that each of us plays in efficiency, in changing our energy behavior. What you do and what I do are the most important part of our energy future. To make the switch, Dr. Tinker says very simply, no matter what energy we'll use in the future, we have to use less of it. So energy efficiency has to become a habit in our everyday lives. 
all of us. Now, coming up, how one solution touted as a main way to reduce carbon emissions, well, it may not be the answer at all.